you very much, Sophia, and good morning to all of you. I mean, I can only echo what Kathy and Sophia said earlier. I'm also really excited to be out in real life, not sitting behind a screen uh, for, for a conference. It's really great to be out and uh, seeing people uh, doing networking, uh, etc. Um, thank you very much for, for inviting me here today. I'm going to already um, announce a little bit of a spoiler alert because I'm not going to be talking about uh, IoT, connectivity, artificial intelligence and all these uh, items. I'm going to invite you into a little bit of the regulatory uh, engine room and the one thing, the overall, um, the overall item which really uh, uh, is decisive for, for the future regulation is actually data, especially when we look at decarbonization. Um, just to pick up on where, where Andreas uh, left one of his conclusions, I mean, I would say that digitalization is a key component towards uh, decarbonization, zero, zero carbon emission. And it's actually vital for adopting the right regulation that our industry needs. So, just to set the scene, sustainability, that's a must. I don't think you'll have, you know, a, a business uh, in a few years' time if you're actually not taking sustainability seriously. Is there a legislative push? Yes. Some would say it's too little, too late. But we definitely see something, and that's where I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to go through the legislative um, um, uh, proposals that we are facing right now. Do we see new alliances? And a, and a much more or an increased uh, awareness uh, and focus on environmental footprint, definitely. And the whole way through, data remains crucial. Very briefly, who are we? Where I come from, Danish shipping, we represent the world's uh, sixth largest fleet measured and operated tonnage. We are Denmark's largest export industry. Um, bringing home around 237 billion each year. Uh, we are both an interest, that's me, I'm a lobbyist, basically full-blown lobbyist, and, but we're also an employer's organization uh, negotiating um, um, waste agreements, uh, and bargaining deals, etc. And then we have uh, a representation in Brussels as well. And then somebody would say, well, in Brussels, why not IMO? Well, that's because in Brussels, a lot more is, is happening at a totally different pace and, and, uh, than at IMO level. So, our ambition, it's very, very clear. In 2050, we will be carbon neutral. And that's going to be without offsetting. That's a very important part of it. There are other industries also saying, well, I think it's actually... It's, 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 a bit of a, it's a bit of a news if you do not say you're going to be carbon neutral by 2050. But many industries do have that little but. Offsetting is, could be part of it, not for us. Then we also need to have zero emission uh, vessels in the water by 2030. This uh, ambition was, was, uh, was established back in 2019. I think Maersk uh, already beat, it, beat us to it uh, by announcing they're going to have the first uh, methanol zero emission vessel in the water by 2023, followed by eight uh, larger container carriers. For us, any climate-related uh, regulation uh, needs to be flag neutral. That means it needs to apply to all vessels, regardless of the flag they're flying. It needs to be enforceable. It should not be an option to be actually uh, to get an advantage by being non-compliant uh, simply because regulation is not enforced. So when regulators are imposing strict and costly regulation on ship owners, they should also step up to the plate and actually uh, enforce the same regulation they adopted. It should push uh, the transition that we're facing from traditional to, to green fuels. So any market-based measure should, where the revenue should be part of pushing this transition. It should award first movers. It should not be a disadvantage to actually go out um, and, and do the trial and error uh, part uh, when, you, when you apply new technology or if you apply uh, new fuels, it, you should be rewarded and definitely not punished.
And then any regulation should also deliver real reductions. That seems so simple, but actually not. I mean, if you're just imposing, a, let's say, I'm going to come back to it, but the emission trading scheme that shipping will now be part of uh, very soon, if you were just imposing that without actually thinking transition to new fuels, etc., uh, energy infrastructure, then you will basically just be creating a revenue, but you wouldn't uh, drive any, any transition, you wouldn't drive any trend, uh, um, reductions. So, well, why is this even important? I think we have a very gloomy outlook uh, when we just take a look at the uh, IPCC report uh, that came out just uh, last month. Because um, despite total decarbonization, well, global warming will actually continue to increase for the next 30 years. In terms of the CO2 budget, well, if we're aiming for the, for the 1.5 degree target from the Paris Agreement, well, sorry guys, we've already used 80% of our CO2 budget. This is, of course, for the, for, for, for the global situation in general. So is there anything in the IPCC report that is related to shipping? Well, yes, if you look a little bit beyond the, just the normal CO2 uh, uh, emissions, if you actually uh, consider all uh, GHG gases, methane, and why methane? Well, methane is, is, is part of, the, if, you, if you apply LNG to your vessels, you will have um, emissions uh, from, from, of methane. And actually, methane is, is far more damaging to both health and climate, as you all know, than just uh, CO2 itself. And I'm, come, come, I'm gonna come back to that um, and also explain why it's so important to us as industry that we do not just uh, limit ourselves to talk about CO2, but actually include all uh, greenhouse gases. So, it looks pretty gloomy. Well, let's move into the regulatory engine room, IMO. What do we actually have there? What has IMO actually accomplished? I don't agree with the gentleman over there saying that IMO has, has, nothing, has, has not really accomplished anything, or I, can't know I don't know how exactly you, you put it into words, because for us as industry, IMO is exactly what the member states make it. Nothing more, nothing less. IMO consists of member states. So if the political will is not there among the member states, that's why you see the slow uh, progress. That's why you see the lack of decisions. Like, that, that's why you see unambitious uh, decisions, perhaps. We all know that the target of IMO right now is to have a 50% reduction of absolute emissions by 2050, and I'm talking about full uh, decarbonization. But will IMO actually follow? I'm going to come back to it. We do have uh, technical and operational measures uh, in place. Some of the technical guidelines are still being developed, but we actually do have regulations in place. So IMO is actually the one single um, international global uh, governance body that has actually adopted global regulation. IATA, no, sorry, ICAO uh, has not done the same thing. That's the aviation, uh, the equivalent uh, organization uh, for aviation. They have adopted something which is far less uh, binding, actually not even legally binding. So, so one, should, one should remember this when, when criticizing IMO for, for, being, for being slow. What we need here is not only the technical and operational measures, because they will address the energy efficiency. Energy efficiency is a very, very important part of this journey as well. Not only because it's the low-hanging fruit you can pick, but also because the gap between the price on traditional fuels and the new uh, green fuel types is rather large. So any energy efficiency, any optimization will also um, show uh, and in, your, in your budget at the end of the day. So energy efficiency remains, remains important. But we also know nobody, energy efficiency is not going to take us to absolute emissions, and it's definitely not going to take us to the, to the carbon neutrality that we're, we're looking at. That's what, what do we need there? Well, we need a market-based measure. We need a, a mechanism that can come in and actually sort out or alleviate the, the, the gap between the price on the traditional fuels and the new uh, green fuels. Well, again, what does data have to do with this? Well, of course, some of these, both technical and operational measures, you have to submit uh, data um, through the IMO data collection system. 
That's a, that's a, that's a very, that's a good thing. We, there is nothing wrong with that, apart from the fact that IMO is actually not measuring energy efficiency. IMO is measuring the dead weight tonnage, and that's a constant figure. So you can be loading your, your, your vessel very efficiently, but you won't really, that really won't show at the end of the day in the number you get out at the end of the calculation, because they're not taking actual cargo carried into consideration. So what we need here is to revise, go back and revise the, 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 the data collection system and update it to actually be based on uh, the energy efficiency operation indicator, the EEOI, instead of the AER. That's uh, enough of uh, operations for me for today. But that's the problem. We're using a proxy, the dead weight tonnage. We need to use the actu actual cargo carried in order to incentivize that you operate your vessel in the most efficient way. That's a political decision, and that's a very sensitive decision. And I think it also goes back to why can we just, just, I mean, this seems obvious, this is the best way to do it, so why don't you just, you know, IMO get your act together and do this? Well, I think, again, and I have to be honest here, it's not only some of the, uh, some of the member states within the industry, there is a lot of reluctance to actually go for actual cargo carried, and I think it refers back to what Andreas also mentioned, that some of the business, well, the operational model was, Was that better? Okay, sorry, <laughs> I didn't realize. <laughs> um, the operational model was developed more than 100 years ago, so I can also say, I mean, shipping is one of the most conservative industries, and I think that also have, has to, you know, so that's why there, there is also reluctance, even within the industry, for actually using the right data. Okay, so moving on from, as I said before, from IMO to the EU, uh, the EU is incredibly important. When I started to work in this industry 12 years ago, I was told, forget about the EU, it's only IMO, it's global regulation. But throughout these 12 years, we've seen the EU step by step taking on board different parts, especially when it comes to environmental regulation. We have sulfur regulation, we have... Um, uh, the ship recycling uh, regulation, and now we have the EU Fit for 55, which is a huge legislative, legislative package presented by the Commission uh, back in July. It covers all industry sectors uh, of in, in Europe, apart from agriculture. Why not agriculture? Because agriculture is the really is the black sheep and has to do with a lot of disagreement between the two old member states, France and Germany. So leave uh, agriculture aside, but every other single industry is uh, covered by uh, these legislative proposals. I'm just going to introduce three of them, the most important ones for, for related to shipping. First of all, the emission uh, trading scheme, ETS. Aviation is already part of it. Now uh, it's proposed that shipping should also be part of it. So you basically surrender allowances and you buy allowances and you surrender allowances uh, according to what you've uh, emitted uh, throughout the year, just to be very, very brief. Fuel EU Maritime is, is addressing uh, the fuel that you, uh, that you burn and sets requirement for the energy intensity uh, within your fuel. And then finally, we also have the Renewable Energy Directive, which sets in process requirements on, on, on member states to actually provide renewable energy for the sectors. That's why we perceive this as a triangle. If you only had, let's say, the ETS, as I said before, yes, you will create a revenue. Would you really drive any reductions? Not really, because what would be the incentive? The, the price for an allowance uh, today is 55, uh, 55 euros for, for a ton uh, uh, of emissions. I mean, 55 euros, yes, it's money, but it's not really going to drive anything. The transition that we need is, is to start to look into the fuel, what are we actually burning? Set standards for, for the content of your fuel tanks, energy intensity, as I said, but also um, biofuels, et cetera, uh, methanol, the new e-fuels, um, et cetera. And finally, well, are we as industry, not only shipping, but also other industries, are we supposed to do this all by ourselves? No, it's actually good that the member states 
are also obliged to, to provide some of this uh, new uh, renewable energy content in, in the future fuels. And again, data here is a key component because the ETS will be based on the MRV system, the Monitoring, Reporting and Verification System that came into force back in 2015. And the difference between the MRV and the IMO DCS data collection system is that the EU MRV actually is based on actual cargo carried. So here you can really measure your energy efficiency. That was a huge fight back in 13, 14 when this was negotiated in Brussels. And I can say that Danish shipping, I think we were the only ones calling for actual cargo carry to be part of, of, of the, the equation. And I've taken so much heat for this, and I still do, but it is the right way forward, because only in that way you can incentivize the right development that we, that we need, both in terms of energy efficiency, but also transition itself. So, are we just talking about a legislative push? No, others are pushing as well. We have first zero emission uh, vessels underwater already within this decade, which is, which is necessary because they, the, the vessels put underwater within this decade are also the one that will be uh, in operation when we, hit, when, we, uh, when we reach 2050, simply because of the, of the, of the lifespan uh, of, uh, of uh, commercial vessels. We'll have the carbon neutral uh, methanol uh, vessels uh, from Maersk very, very soon also others. We also have electrification of, of ferries, etc. And then, as Sophia mentioned, we have ship owners and also in other, uh, other uh, parts of the industry calling uh, for action, calling upon politicians to actually provide the framework that this industry needs. Danish Shipping also signed this call uh, for action. And the call for action is, does not go for us to set a specific target. We're not asking for necessarily carbon neutrality, but we're calling, asking for a target which enables shipping to actually meet the Paris Agreement, whatever that means. That is, of course, up for, for discussion. Also, the pace or, or you know, the, the, the milestones towards uh, 2050. And we need the political framework for that, because one company cannot do this on its own, one shipping nation, although being the sixth largest in the world, we cannot do this on our own either. It's pretty easy, and I'm putting it sort of out there, it's easier, I would say, for a ferry operator and for Maersk because they drive the bus. They know exactly where they stop, at which ports and when. It's easier for them, a ferry it goes, I mean, that's A, B, and then back and forth. Um, it's easier you know, to, to apply new fuel types because you know exactly what you need and you know when you need it. But if you're operating within the tram sector and you're a small company, perhaps operating three, four vessels, and you call ports around in the world maybe once or twice a year, it's pretty difficult to have a secure uh, supply chain uh, for, for, uh, for, uh, for new fuels. That's why we need regulation for this as well because we cannot do this on our own. So, customers are demanding as well. Just took a few articles from, uh, from Shipping Watch uh, lately. IKEA, uh, that's of course again liner shipping, but interesting, Trafigua. So it's not only the ones where, where consumers uh, have a say as well uh, when you go to, to IKEA and buy your stuff. Trafigua, it's actually, they're also now calling for, for um, transparency and higher uh, targets. So, Again, coming back to data, which is, the, is my keyword today, the decarbonization of supply chains. And I mean, if, not, if it's not regulation, and if it's not your customers, I would say reporting is an increasing um, challenge for, for, for ship owners as well, because there is a demand for, for, for reporting. I'm sure you're all familiar with reporting of your emissions within scope one, two, and three. And since, uh, for many companies, the transport Part. Scope 3 is part of their own reporting and is part of their own uh, target reduction targets. Shipping needs to have, need to have its, its data, um, data right, and it needs to be transparent and it needs to be validated in order for, for, for actual reporting to actually be, be, uh, be useful. I mean, we transport almost you know, between 80 and 90 percent uh, goods at sea, so it is a quite a substantial part 
of the emissions within these uh, reporting uh, in scope in scope three that I was what I was referring to before was basically scope one that's your own emissions so whatever is, is burned and what are, whatever is emitted from the from the from the stack on, 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 on the vessels but here we're talking about what happens in your supply chain and that is quite important for not if not for your perhaps not for yourself if not for yourself then for your customers yeah So, finally, empowered by data, regardless of, we're talking regulation, customers, operation, and then the innovation that we need and the technology improvements that we also uh, need. We need to, I would say, kill your darlings, because it is a very conservative industry. It has started to definitely change. If you just look at what, what, what shipping companies are hiring these days, it's not necessarily traditional shipping people. It's people with a different background, coming from information technology, et cetera, much more advanced uh, than, than just you know, normal uh, shipping people. They're also part of the core business, but you see different, you see shipping companies in transformation uh, these days because the ones that have grasped the importance of getting data right and want to be at the forefront and make this into an advantage, well, they are also transforming themselves from traditional shipping companies to something far more uh, advanced in, in the future. Yep, and with that, I'm just going to say thank you and I'll be happy to take any questions you may have. Maria, if I may, I actually have a question for you. Uh, you have been part of the Danish Climate Partnerships, and uh, you've been talking here about how we are late. And decarbonisation is a systemic challenge, and we need to coordinate across different sectors. Can you, from kind of the top of your mind, mention any transferable learnings, this experience with, at a very fast pace actually, coming up with Denmark's coordinated climate strategy, and any learnings that could be mm. interesting for this room here? Yeah, well maybe I should just very briefly introduce what the climate uh, partnership is all about. I mean, that was the government back in, in, in 2019, uh, they established 13 partnerships with all industry sectors in, in Denmark. Um, and the aim was, because in Denmark we have a 70% absolute reduction target by 2030, and then climate neutrality by 2050. So basically what the government did, quite smart, they invited all you know, very high sea level uh, people to be, uh, to be chairing these partnerships, and then they grouped you know, the different cluster industries, so we were the blue Denmark, so to speak. Danish shipping, we held the secretariat function for, for this climate ship. And the idea was that you should come up with, you know, own initiatives. What can you in industry, as industry do in order to contribute? And what would you uh, recommend the government or what would you ask for the government from the government? And I think, you know, the idea about actually inviting the industry to, 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 to commit itself by uh, own initiatives, while at the same time also asking for, for uh, steps to be taken uh, by the government is quite, uh, was quite a good idea because then you had you know, the respons shared responsibility. And for us, I mean, the government, I mean, we will, we will hold the government accountable for them to actually deliver on some of our uh, recommendations. And, and they did this, and they're, they're not done yet, but, but they did. Um, we also, as industry, of course, have to, 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 to deliver on our uh, own initiatives. But the idea about you know, bringing industry and, and, and uh, politicians together and then you know, the government and then actually you know, make a commitment in that sense, I think is, a, is, quite, a, is quite a strong initiative. Because uh, as we are developing smart maritime solutions, it may be beneficial to understand what role they can play in a wider ecosystem as well. And therefore I was interested to hear if you had any ideas about can, can this be something that we can learn from in conversations at the IMO, for instance, to look at a wider perspective? I think, I think again, I mean, <laughs> this is a very Danish thing because we have, you know, a very 
open system. We have a very collaborative system between industry organizations, uh, companies, and the political level. You don't have that in the same way in, in, in other parts of the world. So I'm not sure you could, you know, just take the idea, the concept, and apply it, you know. Uh, but, but I think, you know, the idea, and one of the things that we, I mean, if I should just scratch a little bit in, into the, one of the initiatives, I mean, that's, that's uh, sharing data, actually. <gasps> I mean, that's one of the things that we as industry said, well, you know, I think there is an unleashed, we think there is an unleashed potential in, in actually sharing data. And if we can build um, a model, a platform where you can share your, your data on emissions, making it more transparent for your customers, um, um, et cetera, uh, when they actually, you know, choose who to do business with, to put it bluntly. Uh, one of the things there was simply to, to look into, can we, can we do this? Yeah. yeah. So right. just to give you a concrete example. Yes. Yeah. Maria, thank you so much. You're welcome.